we'll call our special meeting of city council to order for um, Thursday, June 20th, 2019. And um, our first item of business this morning is our uh, delegations, Emma Greendale and Katrin from Urban Systems are in attendance. Regarding our uh, Dawson Creek zoning bylaw update and council workshop. And um, so I think first off we'll um, ask the ladies to come forward and do we need, uh, at this point it's a delegation for information. Good morning, welcome. Good morning and thank you. Beautiful day. Yes, it sure is. <laughs> Moisture is a good thing. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, so first of all, thank you for making the time for us. Um, I realize this is a special meeting so that we were able to work with your schedules and uh, be before you here today. Um, our goal today is really just to recap a number of the topics that we've talked about in our previous workshops. And really, when we leave today, what we'd really like to leave with is your support for the general direction that we'd like to take the zoning bylaw in before we, we do make edits to it. And that direction um, is really reflecting the things that we've heard from the public, from developers, from yourselves, and from staff. And so that's what's been sort of all brought together in, in this um, issues identification report, which is the purpose of our presentation today. Is there an on on this thing? On the side. Other side. Ooh, there we go. There. <laughs> so we only have a few things to talk about today. We just wanted to give you an update on the project timeline. We're going to recap at a high level because we, uh, we were challenged with concentrating the amount of information that was in the issues identification report to something that's presentationable. <laughs> and then we we'll talk about the next steps and open up the floor to any questions and comments. And as usual, you know, feel free to um, provide your comments and questions as we go throughout the presentation. So from the project timeline, um, we've shown you this before, there's really four phases in this. There was the issues identification, the technical review, we've done a lot of engagement with, with the public and worked really closely with staff and yourselves to get us to this point. So we're right at the tail end of phase two, which is the technical review side. Um, and then once we wrap up today, we will be sitting down and really working at preparing a draft zoning bylaw, um, which we will, of course, be bringing back forward to you today. Um, from all of the work that we've done so far, there was really 10 key topic areas that have emerged. And so these were, again, a combination of elements that were raised by staff, by yourselves, and things that we heard from the public. So we've grouped them into these, these 10 areas. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Emma, and she's going to work through um, talking about these these topic areas. Sure. And like Katrin said, please feel free to comment and ask questions as we go through. Um, but the first is short-term accommodation. Um, so as previously said, um, there's no clear definitions or regulations um, or concrete direction really from the provincial level with respect to um, how short-term accommodations are regulated in residential areas. And so that's resulted in, we've talked about previously, especially examples of the rooming and boarding houses um, in locations that they're not desired in the city. So the recommendations for consideration um, <coughs> are potentially adding in a definition for short-term rental accommodations uh, and then deleting the definition for rooming and boarding housing um, as that will then be encompassed within the short-term rental accommodation definition. Uh, and then as well, reviewing and consolidating the definitions and permitted uses so that we have some regulations for those short-term accommodations. And as well, uh, simultaneously looking at the definition and general regulations for the bed and breakfast accommodations and making sure that those are clearly distinct from one another um, and that the intent of bed and breakfast is for those um, vacation uh, rentals and things like that and that the uh, short-term or short-term rental accommodation is more for the um, work-related accommodations. Um, 
we, as Katrina and I have talked since developing these slides, maybe the wording for room and boarding houses might be more appropriate as it's more specific than short-term rental accommodation um, so that there's not as much confusion between short-term rental and bed breakfast. So um, what, what we do with the specific wording might change a little bit, but the intent is for, um, for there to be two fairly distinct um, definitions and purposes for short-term rentals, though that being the more vacation side and the, and the more work accommodation side. So for me, I just uh, <coughs> would like to uh, co make a comment, and we, well, I think we have uh, historically seen this as residential uh, properties mm -hmm. who are using them for what would be probably a not a residential purpose, but a commercial purpose. Um, for the most part, they're an investment property uh, with suites. They're a boarding house or rooming house, a what we term our crew house, where it's used for the rental of six or seven bedrooms for uh, maximizing that uh, and minimizing cost, but they really are a commercial enterprise. And, mm -hmm. and, and to me, I kind of feel like that's a, a way for us because we're now having these um, businesses compete with those commercial enterprises in our community, mm -hmm. but they fall within everything about residential for zoning, for taxation, for all those things. And, and to me, I, I just think that we got to try and find a way to level that field and also quality of life for a neighborhood and all of those things. So anyway, just kind of, I think about that and I honestly don't know enough about kind of the the, re the legalities of how we can, and if we can do that even in terms of how that property, where we ide identify business license, but commercial purposes and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And certainly the zoning bylaw really does deal specifically with land use and what's on the land. So some of those things that you've mentioned would need to be addressed in other complementary bylaws, right? Whether it's, you know, changes to the business licensing bylaw to really articulate some of these things or, or other city bylaws and policies that you have. Um, you know, your point about, you know, a lot of these short-term accommodations being more commercial oriented, certainly on the crew houses and that kind of thing, is a, is a really valid point. So we'll uh, definitely make a note of that and just see what we can do in terms of, because we still, I think what we've heard is, you know, we still want to see suites and we still want to see all of these types of things in a residential neighborhood. It is really the the residential dwelling that is not, there's nobody living there permanently and it really is that revolving door kind of rental sort of accommodation that maybe that is not as appropriate in a residential neighborhood and might be better suited more on the fringe maybe with residential and commercial, right, where you've got... The line becomes blurred to me where we're in looking to increase density, looking to increase the uh, land use yes. uh, of uh, residential use and encouraging density, but at the same time um, impacting that overall mantra of quality of life and for a neighborhood mm -hmm. and how that blurs then for me in terms of yeah. how they're being used. Councillor Dvekov? Yeah. The, the biggest issue that I've heard with uh, you know these uh, rooming houses and that type of thing is the parking mm -hmm. and I know that from experience uh, you get a boarding house with uh, six or eight bedrooms and the, the street is plugged with vehicles mm -hmm. so you know how you control that I think you you know I guess it starts with the zoning but it then it to be controlled somehow it has to go through a you know, a business license, or I don't know, but somehow that's that's the spin-off problem. Mm -hmm, yeah, and we'll talk to um, changes to the parking regulations later. But we have added in uh, regulations for short-term accommodation, bed and breakfast, um, as well as home occupation, and a few other um, secondary uses in residential areas into the parking regulations. So we'll touch on that later for sure. The parking regulation is one way but mm -hmm. uh, once you've got the problem mm -hmm. it's very difficult to deal with through bylaw enforcement and you know the ticket is 25 bucks mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. <coughs> in Vancouver that gets you about 10 minutes worth of parking mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it has to be somehow prevented mm -hmm. as opposed to dealt with through yeah. parking bylaws or whatever mm -hmm. 
Duncan? Um, so we had some conversations through your worship about you know this is the, the zoning component but we did talk about that business license and they have they have noted it up there and we've talked about you know what some of the other communities are doing and and they're you know in the parking specifically and i know we're going to get into that area you know they're requiring parking plans to be submitted with a business license and if you don't adhere to your parking plan then there's you know a warning or you have your business license removed and you can't provide that accommodation anymore we're not there yet the first step is really getting into the the zoning and figuring out what those requirements are but there are some options out there and that will be kind of the next step once we get the zoning figured out pressure of services of how we provide services and that's water and sewer because they take on more demand for water and sewer uh, waste collection and waste usage and you see that mm -hmm. uh, because they and they absolutely do produce more waste you can you don't only have to drive by to see that and then the parking issue and so I think that's kind of the components to yeah. me that thank you. Alrighty, so the next one uh, to talk about is suites. Um, so kind of bouncing off the short-term accommodations too. Um, there's many instances of suites occurring in neighborhoods um, that are unable to accommodate them for a variety of reasons, but mostly in terms of density and parking um, or suites in areas where they were not previously permitted. Um, so our recommendations for consideration. One of the main ones is really to consolidate the terms and definitions um, of suites. Um, the bylaw currently has <coughs> house, in-law suite, secondary suite, <coughs> suite. Um, so a bunch of different types of suites that really all mean the same thing. It's, a, it's an accessory dwelling unit. So we propose um, to clean that up and to have secondary suite, meaning that it's an attached suite within the principal dwelling, and detached suite, meaning it's an exterior suite, uh, and then just the suite definition by itself um, is intended for suites in non-residential zones. So that's um, suites in commercial and industrial zones that we talked about, security, security suites. Um, and then reviewing and consolidating the general regulations for those suites, again, to make sure that um, we're regulating the suites and all of the, the different regulations for crew house and in-law suite are captured within the secondary and detached suite regulations. Um, and then uh, developing regulations for accessory dwelling units in industrial or institutional parcels and making sure that those are um, following the residential uh, suite regulations as well. Uh, Duncan and I uh, had the opportunity to go to Grand Prairie about a year and a half ago maybe and met with the mayor and CA over there and talking about common issues that uh, communities uh, deal with and certainly Grand Prairie as they've developed uh, they're much uh, bigger city and obviously have dealt with a ton of uh, development issues over their uh, course of their uh, development over the last 20 or 30 years and we talked about suites with the Grand Prairie and one of the concepts that they've developed and we, I haven't followed it up back with them but they've defined within their um, RS2 zone I'll use that and I don't know if it's the appropriate but in an RS2 where you allow the suites uh, they have a defined radius so that you have within a 500 uh, meter radius you're allowed to have the suites within there but then you're not allowed to have any further development of suites mm -hmm. and it, what it does is then it allows you to have some areas with development of suites and density mm -hmm. but you also then have single family traditional single family without the suites so that you don't have the a development of entire neighborhoods and entire areas of suites that helps hopefully lessen the impact on parking and all of those other things. It was an interesting concept and I don't know if you guys have had any uh, uh, interaction or any uh, history with that. Not specifically, like I've, I've heard about that and I think what comes to mind for me initially is that works well potentially in an established neighborhood but if you're developing a neighborhood and you've got the first house in, right, and so how do you go, like if you're first out of the gate, great, you can have a suite but if you're a couple of years down the road and you've got enough development there, sorry, yeah. too bad kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm not sure how that would play out, you know, wh whether when you compare existing development where somebody now wants to have a, a legal suite in their on their property versus new development so that would be something to keep in mind yeah. like i said I, it was just yeah. a concept they've de they've yep. developed i've never i haven't followed it back up and i don't know if duncan's mm -hmm. had any further conversation with them either but anyway it was just an interesting concept That's to me that good, yeah. kind of uh when you're seeing a, a development occur in a new subdivision development um then you are going to allow uh, four or five 
homes with suites are going to be allowed within that radius, but then that's all. And so, anyway, like I said, I just it was an interesting concept, but I wasn't sure what the uh, operational impacts yeah. of that would be. Yeah. Worship. Yep. Go ahead. Um, uh, under detached suites, do we see anything other than coach houses falling underneath of that, or do we have other descriptive that in the current bylaw? Well, in this proposal, so cleaning it up under detached suites, would it just be our coach houses that people are asking to develop or just like, so some have garages or are we saying you could build a suite without a garage, like you could build a detached building without a garage? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. It really, the, the term detached suite is meant to eliminate the need for all of those multiple terms that are very specific, Absolutely. right? So yeah. whether it is a suite that is above a garage, that's a detached suite, right? If yeah. the garage is detached from your house. If it is just a standalone coach house, that would be that would be a detached suite. If it's, you know, people call them granny flats, that could be a detached suite. So it eliminates those okay. terms that are used so interchangeably Perfect. because they are all detached from the principal dwelling. And so that, I think that simplifies it for a lot of people. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Here we go, everyone's favorite, Austin oh, Parking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one of the main issues is that the current parking sizes and regulations are they're not reflective of the needs of property owners, or um, really the dimensions are limiting everywhere in the city. So one of the biggest um, recommendations is changing the parking space dimensions from 5.5 meters long to 6.5 meters long to accommodate the average size pickup truck. Uh, I think we had talked about that in the previous workshop too. Um, and then increasing the number of uh, residential parking requirements as we stated earlier. Uh, I think the next slide will get into um, the short-term rentals. But increasing the parking as well for single detached, duplex, semi-attached, triplex and fourplex to all include two off-street parking per dwelling unit. Um, for apartment and townhouse dwellings for, to include one off-street parking for each bedroom in the dwelling unit, um, and then as well as 15% of the total, uh, of, 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 sorry, additional visitor spaces representing 15% of all the parking. Uh, and for suites both secondary and detached to include two off-street parking spaces per suite. So um, I'm, I'm going to jump in because sure. uh, Kevin and I have had a little bit of a conversation about this and um, the history of uh, development for subdivisions and cities and streets has been, we built the city with the minimum street size at 10 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, that will accommodate uh, two cars parked on the side of the road and we still have travel uh, lanes available. Mm -hmm. But if we move that dynamics from that to minimizing the street size to five meters or six meters as a uh, maximum so that you have one lane in each direction and you have no off street parking but this the, the requirement to have the lot size sufficient that it then creates the ability to provide it all for off street parking on the subdivision development we minimize the impacts of maintenance construction costs, parking, and move that parking requirement to the property owner uh, and the developer to keep the property sizes at an appropriate size to accommodate all of the parking off. Because what we do when we do this is we say, <coughs> we're gonna build the street to accommodate traffic uh, and parking, and if we narrow it to allow it only for traffic and our services, but no off-street parking and, and, it, and then move that off-street parking to the properties, then that changes that dynamics. It reduces the long-term costs for the city in terms of repaving, construction costs, um, and uh, parking issues, and then it improves efficiencies of snow removal and waste collection and all those things. So anyway, it was a really interesting <laughs> uh, uh, idea to me. Again, and I don't know if you've had any uh, experience with that. You know, I, I don't know if I would eliminate all the on-street parking, but certainly the intent and the zoning bylaw only deals with off-street parking. Your, your traffic bylaw will deal with any on-street parking and those corresponding regulations. So they are quite distinct in, in that regard. Um, you know, the parking regulations that you do have, I think are, 
you know, they're, they're from a different time, and so they aren't reflective of the vehicles that people have today, the sizes, the quantities, those kinds of things, right? And so, and I think, you know, requiring more of those to be on the property is, you know, where I think we, we want to go. That being said, we don't want to regulate it to the point where it's like, you can't park on this street because that is still, you know, something, but maybe the amount of on-street parking is, is less, right? So it's finding that balance. And because the other thing too is we, we don't want to have the pendulum swing fully from one side to completely the other, right? So just balancing those kinds of needs of, of the community. Perfect. So just continuing with the uh, recommendations for off-street parking, like I said earlier, um, as some of the um, accessory residential uses, requirements of one parking spot for each bedroom in a short-term rental, and that would include uh, bed and breakfast as well too, so that would be regulated at the same time. Sorry, short-term rental wouldn't include bed and breakfast, but there would be the same regulation for both of them. Uh, home occupation, requiring one off-street parking space for the home occupation in addition to the requirements of the principal dwelling unit. And for community care facility, one parking space for every three beds, plus one off-street parking space uh, for each residential staff, and one visitor spot for every three dwelling units. And uh, we left, or we recommend to leave the um, senior supportive and assisting housing of one off-street parking for every three dwelling units alone. Perfect. The next one was universal access design. Uh, and Katrin, Katrin can speak to this a little bit more, but we had uh, a consultant um, look at the current bylaw um, from an accessibility lens and kind of see what uh, issues could potentially arise or what um, opportunities there were for creating uh, more accessible uh, spaces using the zoning bylaw as a tool. Uh, and one of them was ensuring that parking spaces are accessible for people of all abilities. Um, so some recommendations from that would be adding uh, drawings of parking stalls with minimum dimensions and best practices um, for accessible parking stalls. Um, update, updating the off-street parking uh, table um, to require the number of designated stalls and just mm -hmm. making sure that that number aligns with current best practices. Um, considering a variation on the number of designated spaces for um, use different uses. So a uh, community care facility might have a different number of required uh, accessible parking spaces. Um, and then also adding in potentially a different designation for limited mobility rather than just the uh, handicap that we have right now too, an additional, uh, an additional limited mobility category. There's a lot of work being done today to make sure that communities are accessible and that people of all abilities are able to get around and to access, you know, get out of their vehicles or whatever forms of transportation they use and be able to access the sidewalks and things like this. So the fellow that looked at this is actually a quadriplegic. Um, so he's definitely got mm -hmm. the right eye for, for viewing, you know, these kinds of things from that perspective. So these were just some of the recommendations that he's, he's offered out that, you know, we'd like to, to incorporate into your bylaw just to make it more more accessible for, for all. Perfect. Uh, home occupations. Um, so we've talked about this um, previously in the last council workshop, um, but the current home occupation regulations and live work regulations, um, there's some confusion between the two of them and what the intent, uh, what the purpose of them are. Um, especially around the home occupation, it's, uh, it can be restrictive and prohibited to a lot of occupations um, that are desired by the community, we heard in the community engagement, um, and in some cases already occurring. So our recommendations are to uh, replace some of the existing home occupation regulations, just updating them, reflecting current best practices, um, and looking to see what low impact home, op, uh, home occupations are already occurring and making sure that those um, are count accounted for. Um, ensuring the regulations meet the uh, modern trends for off-street parking as we talked about earlier, um, as well as uh, signage, staffing, um, hours of operation, and storage of materials, especially storage materials on the property. Um, and then ensuring that home occupations are only permitted as an accessory use within the residential zones and making sure that regulation is in there. 
uh, and then clarifying the live work regulations. So um, whether that be in just the commercial or in industrial as well too, um, making sure that the regulations are there for it uh, and how, how we want to define that. Yeah, because right now you allow home occupations and live work in your residential, residential zones. So it's, I think, you know, if you're the public trying to work through this bylaw, like what, what's the difference between the two, right? So really teasing that apart and saying, okay, in residential zones, home occupations are permitted and making sure that they're flexible enough to accommodate the variety of home occupations that you'd like to see in a residential zone. And then live work is something that would happen in a commercial zone because the home occupation needs to be, excuse me, accessory or secondary to the use of the, the principal dwelling as a residence. Whereas live work, that's not necessarily the case, right? The work might be the primary the use. The work might be the primary use. So that's not what a residential zone is intended for. So really teasing that apart. And when we laid out the permitted uses of all your zones side by side, it became very apparent that you know this was present in most of your residential zones. And, and, and even the developers were like, what is this? Like, so the confusion was, was clearly evident there. So yeah. Perfect. So landscaping, screening, and fencing. Um, so we just reviewed uh, the regulations on landscaping, screening, and fencing, um, and there's some recommendations to uh, encourage landscaping and enhance the visual appeal of Dawson. Um, so part of those would be incorporating landscaping requirements into the downtown uh, and commercial land uses through general landscaping requirements, uh, as well as the development permit area guidelines, so that new development will be encouraged to landscape. Uh, increasing parking lot landscaping and buffering requirements for all zones um, and making sure that there's yeah, landscape around parking lots and that uh, pedestrian access isn't, um, is still encouraged around the parking lots. Uh, and increasing buffering requirements for industrial parcels abutting with non-industrial uses, so <coughs> making sure that there is that buffering um, between the different land uses. Uh, and as well, rail screening. So um, for principles abutting a rail line, it's incorporating additional regulations with um, minimum screening heights. Perfect, and some additional ones um, for agriculture. So following the ministry's, Ministry of Agriculture's Guide to Edge Planning uh, to increase the compatibility um, from the urban and the rural sides of the development. Uh, maximum fence heights, so including maximum fence heights for commercial, industrial, and institutional zones. Um, and then finding an appropriate range for maximum heights of 1.2 meters to 2.4 meters, depending on the use. Um, and then incorporating additional requirements within the development permit area guidelines for all areas uh, not used for the purpose of development to be landscaped. So one of the things that we're facing, um, I think, in terms of um, development, and we see that right now in the current marketplace, and the marketplace really determines the viability economically of development for your community, and, and whether you can um, build into uh, your development permit the requirements that they meet these uh, conditions that you set. Does it make it economically feasible that the marketplace determines what the value of that property is going to be in terms of being able to develop it? And we're seeing that today with respect to some of the development that we're having in the marketplace right now in terms of the downturn and the, the lowering of pro property values and subdivision is making it more and more difficult to meet the requirements that we place in these things. And so landscaping, screening, and fencing is one of those uh, pieces that you add in um, that you see, and to me, we see as being uh, a, a very positive for the development of your community and the uh, beautification of your community and the visual appeal, um, but it all adds into that economic conditions that must be met by the developer in order to ensure that he he adheres to and meets the requirements, and then can he economically develop the property? And I think that's council have to come to that decision in terms of uh, making those decisions in your development permit and the zoning, and um, are you going to see development or not because <coughs> of the requirements you build into that bylaw. Anyway, it's just a comment. <coughs> So the next section, uh, the next issue we looked at was definitions, um, and this is more for um, 
actually uh, utilizing the bylaw um, and just cleaning up um, how the bylaw can be uh, <coughs> used by staff. Um, so the definition section required some modernization, um, including removal of some outdated <coughs> terms and adding in some new terms that have arise since the previous bylaw was written. Um, so that would be consolidate, or some recommendations would be consolidating and removing multiple definitions. Um, for example, there's three different definitions, or three different uses of laundromat. I think we can get that down to one. Um, removal of non-essential definitions. So we had talked about previously coach house, that can, we can use as just detached dwelling. Um, escort service, mural, and service uses. Um, we can review and modernize all the definitions to make sure they meet current best practices and that they're clear and have contemporary and easy to understand language so it's the bylaw is usable by everyone. Um, adding in some key definitions that are missing, so uh, brewery, dwelling unit, dormitory, financial institution, and hotel were some of the ones that we have seen already. Uh, and then incorporating graphics into the definitions, especially for uh, any dimensions or quantitative definitions, um, to enhance understanding and have some visual representation so people can see um, the intent of the definition. Okay, so kind of connected to definitions is permitted uses. Um, so currently the permitted uses in each of the zones are quite pres prescriptive um, and there's uh, a sense of a lack of uniqueness between some of the zones that they'll have really similar uh, list permitted uses. Um, so one, some uh, recommendations for that uh, would be to shift from a stack zoning approach um, and try to unstack it as much as possible where appropriate. Um, so that's especially evident in the residential zones where you know, uh, two zones will look really similar but one of them just adds the use of townhouse for example. Um, Reevaluate and simplify some of the redundant permitted uses and consolidating a lot of the permitted uses. Um, one example being, you know, a use of chiropractor, a use of a physio clinic and counselor. We can consolidate all of those uses into just health services. Um, yep, yeah, streamlining the zones with similar permitted uses. So evaluating all the different zones and seeing if we can collapse any of them. Um, and restructuring them all with intent statements. So determining what the purpose of that zone is and making sure that the permitted uses within it follow that intent. Perfect. So urban agriculture and food security. Currently the zoning bylaw doesn't have any regulations that specifically allow for urban agriculture. So that being rooftop gardens and community gardens. Um, so we propose to add in the definition of community garden, um, that it's a site operated and maintained by volunteers, it was a key term, um, where the produce is grown for personal use. Uh, and then amending that bylaw to include community garden as a permitted use um, in institutional zones, and then as an accessory use only in the multiple family zones. Um, and then as the OCP suggests to expand beekeeping uh, to occur in a wider range of zones and looking at including beekeeping in commercial and institutional zones. Can I ask a question to administration on the beekeeping and it was raised by Councillor Lexstrom and his uh, input mm -hmm. into this. Has it been a, uh, a um, an aspect that's been a demand by residents or businesses in our community to allow for the use of beekeeping? bees in their uh, uh, properties or uh, within their operations and, and the only reason I ask is because we amended the bylaw a number of years ago when we did the hens and bees and, yeah. and cat bylaw I think. I don't know that there's been a huge influx of beekeeping and I'm not sure that we get, I don't know I that we've had any. Yeah. There is some because I know we did um, respond a year or two ago to some concerns there was an individual that had some. And uh, we had to call the bylaw and check it out and everything was, was okay. So that's really the only one. Yeah, we haven't heard a lot and uh, yeah, we haven't really heard anything about beekeeping. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to add in our public engagement, uh, no, one, no one seemed to have an interest themselves in pursuing beekeeping, but we didn't really have any um, uh, uh, conflict on that either. Everyone seemed pretty in support of beekeeping. For and you might actually, now that it is permitted too, you might have more beehives around the city that you're just not aware of because once it's permitted people can do that right they don't need to come and 
and obtain the city's permission. And if you haven't heard anything, I would think that's a good thing. Yeah, I just like I say yeah. when we when we changed the bylaw yeah. a few years yeah. ago, and I'm going to say two or three years ago that we amended the bylaw. And so I just wondered if we'd had any feedback at all from the public after the expansion of the hens and bees and cat bylaw. That did we have we got any of that feedback from our residents about it? I know certainly when we did the engagement for the official community plan, you know, the urban agriculture and just that food security was definitely something that we heard a lot of, which would encompass bees and hens and uh, community gardens, or losing the third term there. So that we did hear that a lot through all of our engagement that people were really in, in support of that. Thank you. Councilor okay. Jureko? Just on that beekeeping, uh, yes. the intention seems to be to expand it to commercial zones. Does that mean it would be uh, downtown? Like a rooftop. Rooftop, yeah. Because that may be an issue. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I think the zoning needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, industrial is one thing, I mean. Mm -hmm. But commercial leaves it quite open. And um, you know, I don't know if we want bees on the, on the roof of the store downtown mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or maybe around uh, K-Pac or you know mm -hmm. I mean allergies and stuff would be a concern I think mm -hmm. okay. some other topics we quickly looked at um, were infill development uh, and this we had actually discussed uh, pretty extensively with the development community and a bit with the general public as well too. Um, so the city had expressed an interest in considering uh, creating a new zone specifically to accommodate infill development, um, especially on the smaller parcels within the city. Um, so the developers didn't seem to think that that would help increase uh, infill development in as much as reviewing the bylaw uh, and just opening up the commercial zones and the residential zones to allow for development. Um, and so uh, it's just going into creating or um, editing the bylaw with the infill perspective to make sure that the zones create that flexibility for development. You know, we see the downtown as an example of that <coughs> mm -hmm. requirement to find a way to spur uh, interest in development downtown and we got all uh, and the city now own a bunch of property down there um, as a result of fires and demolition of old structures and so we have some real prime prime uh, dirt downtown that's sitting empty and and one of the things that I've heard from uh, developers is the one restriction in your policies that you that the guide that or either enhance or restrict the ability is your parking because we have the requirement for off-street parking when you develop a commercial uh, enter entity downtown a commercial building or uh, whether that be retail commercial or residential development downtown the requirement to have the off-street parking p as per the bylaw that says if you have uh, a thousand square feet you need one and a half quarter parking spaces per uh, whatever and so to me there's there's an aspect that's a huge cost in the overall development if you'd have to take some of that uh, restricted size property to provide that off-street parking. So there's an example to me of what either enhances or restricts your ability to develop because of some of the policies you have and, mm -hmm. and, and or what incentives you might be able to offer to somebody to build down there. But I think that to me is an example where we look at that and say, if we're not having development, why is it? Mm -hmm. um, and you've got prime property uh, that's not being developed and there's got to be some policy stuff within there that's restricting it because you do have new construction new development going on in other areas just not down there and so to me there's one that I think we have to look at and certainly one of the things that you have right now in your zoning bylaws you do have a figure that has an area that's exempt in the downtown from providing parking so that's something that we can look at maybe that needs to yeah. be expanded right lots of communities do not require businesses, particularly in the heart of downtown, to provide off-street parking because many of those types of businesses are the kind where you're there for a little bit and then you leave. So, you know, your on-street parking in a downtown is that's where people park. So the need for large swaths of off-street parking in the downtown isn't something that a lot of communities have. So the exemption that you have, and it's, it's figure 5.1 in your bylaw, 
you know, might just need to be something that we look at and see, does it make sense to expand that? Does it make sense to just look at the regulations that you have in there with respect to that to really bolster that if, if parking is, is one of those no. you know, big holdbacks to yeah. development in your event? Yeah, and I, I, honestly, I've not had that kind of expanded conversation with the developers or folks that are looking at uh, investing and yeah. saying, well, there are some of those uh, aspects to it. But uh, to me, there are, there has to be what's restricting you from making the investment to develop yeah. and and it is and it isn't a lack of demand for retail because there is no retail locations downtown are very very few that are sitting empty today and are downtown and that was a bit of a surprise to me because i always said oh your downtown's not uh, active or vibrant Al almost all of the available space downtown today is being utilized by retail and mm -hmm. so what are the policies that we have in place that are either restricting or enhancing the ability mm -hmm. to develop it and that's maybe a good conversation for us to engage our business community and mm -hmm. investment community and real estate community and developers to say um, if there is a lack of demand, lack of opportunity, or is it policy that's restricting it or a combination of both and what can we do? Anyway. Mm -hmm. That's a good consideration. Um, so the city, uh, the current zoning bylaw doesn't speak to the BC Energy Step Code um, and the implementation of the Step Code is outside of the realm of the zoning bylaw. Um, however, uh, it would be recommended for the city to determine what level of the BC step code, the energy step code, um, it wishes to strive for and maybe set a date on that too, or a timeline. Uh, and um, that the city can make amendments to other zoning bylaws too with respect to the step code. December 1st, 2040. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the step code because, oh sorry, is because it's about building construction. Just to be clear, is why it's outside of the zoning ballot, which is with the land, use of the land. Sorry. Councilor Dubeco. So, <coughs> my understanding is there is no uh, provincial requirement for the it's step code. It's simply a topic of discussion at this point. And uh, it seems like the provincial government is, you know, pushing it down to the municipalities, and there mm -hmm. is no consistency between municipalities. Obviously, trying to meet any level of the step code here compared to the Okanagan or Vancouver is quite a bit different mm -hmm. and to me unless the province wants to regulate it somehow or put it into the building code I don't think we should touch the step code you know people build houses I mean they build them according to what they want um, you know, when I built my house, I built it to as much energy efficiency as I wanted. Um, and it's my decision. If the city starts forcing builders to add another thousand or five thousand or ten thousand or more dollars to the construction, then it's the same issue again. You know, are you going to get the development or um, are people going to walk away from it? Or, or just you know so that's my opinion anyways the step code is something that uh, you know I, I think it's more personal you are right it is voluntary as far as I know at this point and they have and every community the ones that are implementing the step code are doing it to different levels because there's the five steps in it right so some are wanting to push it to step three some are higher some are lower and so it really is up to each municipality at this point and you're right it is personal preference i think until such a time as it really becomes mandated and then that's a whole another element okay. to deal and with once, at that once point. it is then yeah. it's not the city that's forcing that's right it. exactly <coughs> it's yep. the province or somebody else yeah. Yeah. and then you know it's a matter of dealing with that election time yeah and and that'll be that would be certainly <laughs> through building code and things like that that those kinds of requirements would be required so councillor wilbur um, just to add to that on that note too technology is changing products are changing so they're mm -hmm. becoming more energy efficient on their own what people are using to construct facilities so i think it's taking a natural progression on its own and exactly to that point why are we doing something that mm -hmm. is going to cause maybe harm to the city in a perspective of development when the provincial government can or whoever could take responsibility for it but i think we're going to find by 2040 that tech the technology and the products out there are going to be completely different from what they are today so i think it's a natural progression just on 
as we as we learn as we go right so no I don't think that it's something that we need to say here's a f timeline we're going to force when reality is the product and technology may do it for us just by two cents they aren't cents anymore oh nickels. that's my nickel worth <laughs> that's my problem they got rid of the pennies that is my nickels worth <laughs> So one thing that will happen by 2040 is the size of the homes will be reduced, I'm sure. You know, it's happening down south where you've got your people living in three or 400 square foot living quarters. Uh, we've got places up here that are like 5,000 square feet or more. You know, gradually that's going to reduce over time, I think. As price of oil goes up and, and it will. <coughs> Perfect. So the last uh, topic in the issues report was just on the aviation, aviation zones. Uh, and the city would like to determine if the airport can be included as the permitted use in the existing institutional zones or uh, if, an, if there should be a new uh, zone developed to replace the existing aviation zone. Um, but as we looked at the bylaw, it didn't appear that there were substantial zoning issues related to the airport property. Um, and we recommend to just keep it within the AV1 zone as is, as it appears to be working, working just fine. If it's not broke, don't, don't fix, fix it. it. <laughs> <laughs> that was more than a nickel's worth. <laughs> <laughs> a whole ten cents. A whole ten cents. <laughs> Uh, so just some other recommendations we had um, when looking at the bylaw uh, and things we had noticed was that the city has uh, 10 commercial uses, um, sorry, so sorry, 10 commercial zones, thank you, um, and to review to see if we can consolidate any of those where appropriate and just reduce the number of overall zones just in terms of implementation of the bylaw. And really where this comes out is you have a number of zones that are these limited zones mm -hmm. where when we look at them side by side with the zone it's limited to, if you will, um, there's only one or two or three, a very few number of permitted uses that are different. Everything else in the zone is, mm -hmm. is virtually identical. Mm -hmm. um, you also have a number of zones that are, that just apply to like one or two properties. So, you know, the question really is, do we need this many zones from an administrative perspective or could we make it just easier to to look at the map to you know have fewer zones because if you've got two that are almost the same, why do you have two? So that those are that's the lens that we were looking at this from. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other recommendations is determining if the city has a need for the M1 service industrial zone. So currently, there's a highway commercial zone, a service commercial zone, a service industrial zone, mm -hmm. and uh, the M2 light industrial zone. So again, seeing if we can, it's another example of collapsing zones. And that was the one that, there wasn't anything zoned? No, there's nothing yeah. zoned. You have a zone in M1. your bylaw, but you actually don't have any properties zoned as such on a map. So, um, with- Can't have too many zones. Oh, you can. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Technically, if you have it in your bylaw, you need to have it on your map. If you have it in your map, you need to have it on your bylaw. So. <laughs> Uh, one of the other recommendations we have is to just take a look at the two comprehensive development zones with staff um, and just to make sure that the permitted uses within the zones are matching the needs of the property owners uh, and making any changes to the zones um, to accommodate for the property owners in the zones. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, just making sure that the accessory dwelling units in non-residential parcels, so those um, live work uses and the suites in industrial zones, um, will be reviewed to make sure that the regulations do fall in alignment with accessory dwelling units in residential zones. Perfect. So we can check off the review with City Council for today. Uh, and then our next step is to start drafting the zoning bylaw and the mapping. Um, and then proceed with that with a review with staff and council before our next round of engagement. So I think, yeah, that is really what we had for today. Um, as you probably noticed, it's a recap of a number of things that we've talked about last time. So really, um, we just wanted to see, are there any concerns with the general direction that we'd like to take the bylaw? keeping in mind that it's reflecting your input, the public's input and staff's input, um, as well as just some of our observations, you know, looking at your bylaw in its entirety. Um, 
are you comfortable with the direction that we're looking at taking it? Um, is there anything that is causing you any anxiety this morning? Hopefully not. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention to you is our intent with any zoning bylaw update is it's never going to be perfect. Let me just say that. I wish it could be, but it won't be. There is always going to be something that we just didn't anticipate or foresaw. You know, the goal really here is to develop or update this bylaw so that it works for most people most of the time. Um, the other thing I wanted to just reiterate is it's not going to resolve existing issues, right? It will apply more to new development as you move forward. So I just wanted to to just reiterate that. Thanks. So I have Duncan first and then I'll come to back. Yeah, so just, just to reiterate uh, through your worship um, what Katrin said. So I mean, there are some pretty big items on here that have been on council's diary through previous, previous councils and um, really there's a bit of a plan within this slideshow of how we're going to move forward so looking for that feedback and we've got some feedback today as we move forward you know the developing that regulation or that zoning for the short-term accommodations the suites the off-street parking those have been some pretty big discussions and i know you've all received feedback from the community on that if if we're missing anything uh, hopefully we've we've got we've captured it today but if there's anything we are missing we'd really like to make sure we include it because the next step is bringing a bylaw to you uh, that will be going out to the public uh, at some point hopefully in the in the near future or in the future <laughs> your future sounds great so, yeah. <laughs> so if there's anything in there that that throws a flag or, or anything that we've missed in here these were the key items that we think uh, we'd heard from council and the public and through the OCP process so anything we've missed it's a good day today to have that discussion and kind of get that general direction so we can get it right. Sure. Councilor Jabeco? Uh, <clears throat> just going back to a couple things. One on off street parking. Mm -hmm. You've got a, the length of a parking spot as 6.5 meters. Mm -hmm. An average uh, crew cab full length box truck is about 22 feet. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got situations like 103rd Avenue right now where we've got a bylaw that says you can't park a vehicle more than I think it's 18 or 19 feet long. So what you have is about every third vehicle is illegal on that street. Uh, if you make that into a 7 meter vehicle then somebody that's got a crew truck can park in that spot. Um, you know, and the, this is a, a city where there's a lot of crew trucks. Mm -hmm. So I think, in my opinion, they should be accommodated. Um, you know, an individual that is building a house may not have a big truck, mm -hmm. but the next person that owns it could. And if you don't have that spot that's available, then they're parking on the street. So it's just one of those prevention things rather than deal with it through bylaw enforcement, which is an extremely difficult way to do deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is landscaping on industrial and commercial lots. We've got situations where on industrial lots, the uh, owners have been um, not forced but encouraged to do landscaping, like to include uh, trees or lawn, mm -hmm. it's not compatible with an industrial lot. An industrial lot is, you know, for industry. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow that has to be um, indicated in, in the zoning process so that a planner that comes into the city and is dealing with a development mm -hmm. plan on an industrial lot doesn't <coughs> must include trees and grass and no. you know boulevards and this type of thing in an industrial lot may I may I speak um, so with the industrial yeah your points are very valid thank you for making those the, we're not saying that every industrial property needs to landscape what we are saying is that if you are adjacent to a commercial or a residential zone then we want to see some kind of above we're not expecting landscape properties to put down grass and trees because you're right it's to completely impatible they they don't survive but there are instances where some type of landscaping and mostly in the with respect to buffering um less compatible uses 
you know, landscape it should be required. But for the, the landscape part or the industrial parcel in an industrial subdivision, no, they wouldn't. Well, where you have interface between, you know, maybe commercial or industrial with residential, um, you're better off with a fence, a barrier of some sort. We've had issues mm -hmm. that have come up here where we've got, uh, you know, a scrapyard like uh, yep. Yep. for cars and stuff, wrecked cars, and a adjacent there's residential yeah you know and you need a buffer there you know trees or a lawn doesn't do much but a fence will at least yeah you know make a difference and i think that's a recommendation increase the buffering requirements for industrial parcels abutting non-industrial users so whatever that might be we want to make sure we have speak to it that there yeah. is some requirement to yeah. and uh, often for those of and often if it is adjacent to residential, what you'll see is fencing, to your point, with some landscape buffering just to break up the large 2.4 meter fenced wall, right? Just to give it a little bit more visual because you are adjacent potentially next to a residential or a commercial use. I don't understand the buffering stuff, but uh, the fence I understand. How, how you <laughs> Fence, <buffering. laughs> trees. <laughs> this is where diagrams are a wonderful yeah. thing. <laughs> thank you. Anything else for Council? Councilor Wilbur? Um, actually, I just want to say thank you because having gone through a little bit of this process myself on a project, I found it confusing with the similarities between zoning and stuff and trying to figure out what I was being told and then looking at the list and then going well it's the same as this and so I think that condensing is a smart move on our part so and and I do like pictures <laughs> <laughs> just saying it is much easier we're all visual people and so I think that makes a process easier for somebody coming in to do something to say okay this is what you mean so for typical for counselor uh, Javetkov a fence with trees be nice <laughs> then, see be easy so no thank you but I do agree with Councillor Javetkov's point on parking so I appreciate that it, it doesn't take care of history but moving forward we have the ability to say to those people that have come to us look we did hear you mm -hmm. and we are addressing it and I think we have to be realistic on the type of vehicles that we drive um, in the north because we're not driving small vehicles so I do think I agree with Paul that that needs to be considered that that sizing to me the um, <coughs> the short-term accommodation the boarding rooming houses has been a big issue for residents who have been directly impacted by them in our community and I think we really want to try to get our uh, mm -hmm. heads and hands around that topic and the short-term accommodation model and uh, I do see them different as residential and commercial and like um, the bed and breakfast so I really look forward to that in terms of finding a way for us to be able to allow our residents to be able to understand what the requirements are going to be mm -hmm. <coughs> and for those who are looking to develop that opportunity that they have the requirements that we're going to expect uh, and uh, the development of them in our community and, be, and then allow the staff to be able to have the ability to be able to deal with them when they do uh, arise um, and uh, I think it's, it's really good for us to get some more tightness around the suites mm -hmm. because I think the suites um, I think we've done a lot in the last five or six or seven years as we've seen the evolution of the suites and I really like how some of that stuff has developed and we're starting to get our understanding the more you the more you develop them the more you experience them the more you learn about the operational and the direct impacts and certainly I um, have a different view today than I did five or six years ago about development of density and suites so I really like that and then this whole policy issue around development of our commercial and infill is a big deal to me. I think we need to do some, make sure we put some real uh, attention into that to try to see what we can do to increase the uh, ability to develop uh, commercial properties uh, in the city and find ways to enhance the policies that allow that and remove some of what might be seen as restrictive components around it. So anyway, thank you for that. Uh, I think you've covered off some uh, very positive stuff. Staff, anybody else? Any, Duncan, Kevin, you guys, guys, Peter, anything? Just one quick thing. Just, I can try to correct me if I'm wrong, but just um, I think what, what I'm hearing is, is that the 
zoning bylaw is one piece, and, and you, you talk about downtown, for instance, we're going to have to look at uh, multiple things, whether it's policy, whether it's zoning, and they're going to have to work in concert, so it's good that we're having the discussion because the zoning is going to have to allow some of these things to happen, but we're going to have to work with with some other policies to encourage development or to make some incentives in the downtown. We're also going to have to work with the zoning to talk and business licenses to deal with parking issues. So it's going to be a suite of things that's going to try and work on some of these issues. I just want the council to kind of be aware of that. That's my yes. understanding and opinion yeah. on that. The zoning is really one tool in your toolkit, sure. right? And it, it doesn't work independently of all of your other bylaws and policies. So they all do, as Kevin said, they need to work you know, collaboratively and, and, and complementary to each other and be having the same yeah. message. Um, yeah. Sure. And then on the parking issues, something that Toy did, and again, for council to be aware, we talk about we want larger parking, off-street parking stalls, which I completely agree with, um, but that has implications. Mm -hmm. That means we're likely going to need to adjust setbacks, mm -hmm. which means we're going to have to probably require larger lots. You know, it all has uh, effects on the outcomes, which then, um, when you go through a subdivision process, it may require the developer to have larger lots to, to allow for more parking, larger parking stalls, increased setbacks. So all of a sudden, that affordability piece comes in because now those lots are bigger than what we've seen in the last 10 years. So again, it's just, it all ties together. And it's and an alternative is to make the street smaller. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do like that too. <laughs> and, and again, it's the whole package. It's not just one thing, but it all has to work in concert. Sure. So that was just my Thanks, guys. And, <laughs> and it's possible. My quarter, of course. My yeah, we're getting bits. up to a buck here. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Ratatouni. Go ahead. I just ahead. wanted to add something to what Kevin said too, is that the zoning bylaw regulates minimums as well too. Mm -hmm. So so that 6.5 would be a minimum or that 7 meters would be a minimum. There's nothing mm -hmm. to say that parking spots can't be bigger than that. But I think the point about us saying we're going to encourage mm -hmm. illegal uh, stuff that now we have to deal with through bylaw and, and so we should think about that mm -hmm. as our sure. Right, and it is a common vehicle type that we experience in our community, and we don't want to make it restrictive for our residents and encourage a wreck then occurring between neighbors. And we have to get into it because our bylaw isn't dealing with it. anything further. Council, so Emma, Trent, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate obviously the work you guys have uh, done and helping guide us into making a uh, informed and uh, uh, conscious decision about how we can help develop the community in a positive moving forward. So thank you for today and thank you for the work you're going and we look forward to the next steps. Thank you very much for your time. Um, further comments, questions from Council? Media question period? Marlon, anything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, motion to adjourn. Councilor Javetkov, Wilbur, all in favor? Opposed, care. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.